This serial killer was supposedly caught in part thanks to one determined Facebook group of internet sleuths. It sounds impressive on the surface, but how true is it really? Did this group genuinely find clues that police couldn't through reverse image searches, Google Maps, and online detective work? Or did their attention only fuel the killer's flames? Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Prism of the Past. I knew that ever since seeing the documentary, Don't Fuck With Cats, I'd eventually end up talking about Luca Magnata. I found this case fascinating because it's one of many that people believe to have been solved by the internet. While some consider this a positive because, hey, more eyes on a case is a good thing, plenty of people believe it's dangerous for the internet sleuths without qualifications to start acting like detectives. Now, before we get a bit into this debate, how it affected the case, and of course, what happened in the first place, this episode is gonna need a huge trigger warning in front of it. Today's episode will discuss animal abuse, suicide, and murder. So please stay clear of it if you are just not in the mood to handle these types of topics today. So with that being said, let's get into it. Luca Magnata was born Eric Clinton Kirk on July 24th, 1982 to mother Anna Yorkin and father Donald Newman in Scarborough, not far from Toronto and grew up in various parts of Canada. Luca was homeschooled until sixth grade and his childhood was troubled to put it mildly. His brother and grandmother called him the F slur on numerous occasions and his mother put his pet rabbits outside in the winter, freezing them to death. In 1994, his father was diagnosed with schizophrenia and his parents split. Luca went to live with his grandmother who eventually began to notice Luca's auditory hallucinations and fearfulness and took him to a doctor. Five years later, around 1999 or the year 2000, Luca received the same diagnosis as his father. After receiving this diagnosis, Luca dropped out of high school and was admitted to a group home. For the next five years, he seemingly attempted to reinvent himself as the Montreal Gazette put it by changing his name to Luca. He also appeared in gay porn throughout this time and ran into trouble with the law. According to my source in 2004, Newman catches the attention of the Toronto police after he befriends a 21 year old woman with the mental capacity of a child eight to 12 years of age, convinces her to apply for credit cards and then racks up $10,000 in unpaid bills. He is charged with fraud. Initially, police allege he sexually assaulted the woman and videotaped it, but the Crown drops the charge before the case goes to trial. Newman's lawyer at the time, Peter Scully, now says that the decision changed the course of Newman's life immeasurably with huge ramifications to our society eventually. I have no idea why the Crown would drop this case. Luca had been diagnosed at this time. He had taken advantage of someone vulnerable, so he clearly needed to be held accountable for his actions. And instead, he was only sentenced to nine months community service and a year of probation for the fraud. Madame Justice Lauren Marshall told Luca that he needed to take his medication or else, quote, your life is going to get messed up, end quote. Well, it turns out Luca seemed to enjoy inviting conflicts as well. For example, in 2007, he began spreading rumors that he was dating a notorious killer named Carla Homolka and posting tribute videos to her from an alias account on YouTube. Joe Warmington at the Toronto Sun published a story about Luca denying the rumors that he himself may have created. Throughout the interview, Luca seems deadpan, almost monotone, as he says the rumors were ruining his life and career as he begs those spreading the rumors to please stop. The following year, Luca created a Wikipedia page about himself and posted an online escort ad under the alias Jimmy to spread more rumors about himself. Throughout this time, he was called cold, remote, and narcissistic within the documentary. By 2010, Luca had moved to New York City and stopped following doctor's orders. His behavior went from strange and occasionally dangerous to outright violent. Luca posted the infamous disturbing video, Three Guys, One Hammer, which shows a man being beaten to death. According to CBC, the myth about Magnata's relationship with killer Homolka grows. In one posting about Magnata and Homolka, the user, likely Magnata, writes, Luca is unable to live unless there is chaos in his life. It makes him feel as though he matters. In December of that year, Luca began committing disturbing acts with his own hands. On the 21st, he posted One Guy, Two Kittens, a video that showed him, face concealed, placing two kittens in a bag and sucking the air out with a vacuum to suffocate them. YouTube quickly removed it, but animal activists found the video and justifiably, they were outraged and horrified. Ryan Boyle created a Facebook group called Find the Vacuum Kitten Killer for Great Justice. Rescue Inc, an animal protection group, posted a $5,000 reward for information leading to the vacuum kitten killer's arrest. Their founder, Joe Pans, referred to this as a gateway crime, 
After all, animal abuse is very commonly known as the first sign of a killer. And to see someone so brutally murder two defenseless animals the way Luca had was incredibly disturbing. And this is where the timeline of the documentary Don't Fuck With Cats begins, with internet sleuths attempting to find the killer. A few of the more serious members eventually created the group Animal Beta Project, abbreviated to ABP, to do so. Deanna Thompson and John Green, members of the ABP, tell their side of the story in the Netflix documentary and explain how they tried to dissect every piece of the one guy, two cats video and everything from the size of the room, to the type of outlets used, to the blanket on the bed, to the voices in the background, everything was picked apart. Luca had traveled the world with an older man he'd met as an escort and had been to Russia, Italy, and France. So naturally it became incredibly difficult for these internet sleuths to even begin to try and find him. But the Find the Kitten Killer group thought they found the killer, a user by the name of Jamzy, and once they had their guy, or thought they had their guy, they refused to let go. Jamzy actually had nothing to do with the crime whatsoever and only told people he was the killer as a joke to troll them. Yet people in the Facebook group, desperate to avenge the kittens, attacked him in full force. Jamzy, a man by the name of Edward Jordan, has been struggling with depression. We can't know for sure if it was the hateful comments that pushed him over the edge, but shortly after he began receiving these vicious threatening messages from the group, he took his own life. And this is where many people start to have issues with the documentary, and honestly, I can't blame them. The internet sleuths attempted to justify the harassment Edward received, blaming it on their heightened emotions. When you're hunting someone like the kitten killer, you risk becoming the monster you're trying to expose, they said. I understand that Edward shouldn't have posed as an animal murderer, but do good intentions truly excuse the actions here? Deanna and John from the ABP were aware at this point that Jamzy wasn't the perpetrator, but thousands of people within the Find the Kitten Killer group took matters into their own hands. Neither group truly broke this case. The ABP group received a message from a sock puppet or a throwaway account that said, the person you are looking for is Luca Magnata. They didn't learn that on their own. John Green did locate where Luca used to live based on photos from Luca's blog. And it seemed as if Luca himself may have been the one leaving these breadcrumbs. It seemed like he very clearly wanted the attention from these Facebook groups and they were giving him exactly what he desired. Now, aside from the attention, Luca also wanted and needed help. While still in New York, Luca reached out to lawyer Romeo Salta, claiming that he was concerned that animal activists were wrongfully accusing him of these crimes. He also wanted to know if there were any warrants out for his arrest and assured Salta that a partner of his, Manny, had actually committed the crimes. Some say this was Luca's way of trying to establish an alibi, though we will touch on this again later. Shortly after this, in January, 2011, while in Miami, Luca had been brought to Mount Sinai Hospital by police and was admitted to the psychiatric ward, according to my source. Hospital staff admitting him described him as being ultra organized with appropriate and normal emotional expression, but he couldn't remember how he got to Miami from New York or how long he had been there. The nursing record on January 19th, 2011 indicates that Mr. Magnata was fearful of a man who had abused him in the past and he was scared that this individual might come back and get him. Watts, the psychiatric for the defense noted in his report. The next day, a psychiatrist saw Magnata and described him as being anxious, paranoid, and disorganized, and she felt he was suffering from psychosis. Some say Luca was strategically building up a diagnosis so he could plead not guilty by reason of mental illness and that he wasn't actually schizophrenic. However, this kind of sounds like a stretch. After all, Luca was diagnosed at the age of 18 and he has a family history. If his behavior was an act, he kept it up for over a decade. On the other hand, two separate crisis workers who saw Luca when he was 18 suspected that he might be putting all this up, end quote. A diagnosis is very hard to unmake after all. After this in February, 2011, Luca moved back to Montreal. He wasn't on medication in the fall of 2011. And according to him, a former lover named Manny, the same Manny we mentioned earlier, visited with his pet Python. Because he was lonely, Luca had purchased two kittens, which he named Jasmine and Kenny. Luca alleges that Manny ordered him to feed one of the cats to the python while Manny filmed it. The following day, Luca claimed Manny forced him to drown the other. The only trouble is that Manny apparently doesn't exist. And to this day, investigators have no trace of this mystery man, Manny whatsoever. The videos of these kittens being killed were again posted to the internet, followed by another massive outcry from animal activists. And just like before, Luca seemingly revealed himself for attention. Luca went to London where he was interviewed about the videos by Alex West, a reporter from The Sun. 
A few days after the interview, West received a message claiming Luca Magnotta was the man he was looking for and specified the hotel he was staying at while visiting London. Though I cannot confirm this, it is extremely likely that Luca sent the message himself. Shortly after confronting Luca, Alex received a taunting email from the kitten killer. The kitten killer writes about how fun it was to watch people try and catch him and promises the next movie he made would feature a human. The email account, like the account that posted the new videos, were both named after two separate victims of the Moore's murders, a series of murders in the 60s, leading many to believe that they were dealing with a serial killer in the making. Tragically, Luca did keep his word when he killed Jun Lin the following year in 2012. Jun Lin used Justin as a given name and went by Patrick on Facebook. Lin moved from Wuhan in central China to Montreal in 2010 to study engineering and computer science. His friends described him as positive and genuine. Duran Lin, Jun's father, called him brave, smart, laughing, caring, adventurous son, and said that his son intended to stay in Canada to start his own business. Jun was 33, reliable, but also a bit shy and hadn't yet come out as gay. He was drawn to Canada's more accepting atmosphere and liberal values, whereas at home, Lin was being pressured to marry a woman. Although family wasn't aware he was gay, Jun did have a boyfriend, Lin Fang. Tragically, Jun Lin's name is forever tied to Luca Magnata and what happened on May 24th, 2012. After Lin passed, his father, Darren Lin, gave a statement that read in part, "'I live each day with regret that all I now see available here will never be his, that his name will only be associated with a horrible, degrading crime. It causes me fresh pain to know that my son's legacy is to be remembered as a victim.'" He not only suffered in his murder, but will be humiliated for each time his name is mentioned and it hurts me deeply and will hurt me forever. Jun and Luca met after exchanging information on Craigslist. Lin had just gotten over a breakup with Fang and was extremely close to his ex, considering that his last text was a good morning message sent to Fang that evening. Fang was in a different time zone. Lin was looking for love, met Magnata and went to his apartment. Surveillance shows the two of them entering, but never leaving. The next day, Lin didn't show up for his shift at a corner store, despite never having missed work before. The next day, on May 25th, another video was posted, one lunatic, one ice pick. In this video, which was beyond disturbing, Luca stabs Jun Lin with a screwdriver fashioned to look like an ice pick and then commits multiple acts of necrophilia and cannibalism while a dog barks in the background. The day after posting the video, Luca fled the country. On the 29th, just as Lynn was reported missing by friends, Montreal police were also called to an apartment building after a janitor found a torso in a suitcase. According to my source, the same day, a foot is found in a package mailed to the Conservative Party in Ottawa. A hand is found in a Canada Post warehouse in a package destined for the Liberal Party. Those who found the foot initially believed it was a sick idea, not that it had anything to do with politics. Lynn's second foot was found near his torso and strangely, a third foot was found. At first, people believed that this meant there was another victim, but it was quickly confirmed that the third one was fake. I wasn't able to confirm if Luca had anything to do with the third incident. Along with the foot that had been mailed to the conservative party, there was a note. Roses are red, violets are blue. Police will need a dental file to identify you, bitch. It didn't take very long for police to piece together that the man in the video was Lynn and that Magnata was the one behind it. Detective Sergeant Claudette Hamlin said that she expected this to be a short investigation. A poster found in the garbage outside Luca's apartment matched a poster shown in the footage of Lynn being stabbed. A puppy, likely the dog barking in the background, was also found in the garbage, along with Luca Magnata's license and other forms of paperwork. Once Detective Hamlin saw the footage of the murder, not only did she have a face to match to the torso, but she was able to connect the pieces of evidence she'd found in the dumpster. The poster, the dog, the weapons Luca had used, Now she saw them in action. Understandably, while describing what she had seen, Detective Hamlin breaks down during the documentary. I'm not going to go into any great detail about what was on the video because it is very, very disturbing and upsetting. Thankfully, naming Luca as a suspect was as simple as putting two and two together, given the abundance of information connecting them. Even though Luca's apartment itself was cleaned, it reeked of chemicals and more security footage unveiled Luca making multiple trips to and from the apartment's garage. Soon, the murder weapon was also found. Once a black light was brought into the apartment, specifically the bathtub where the murder took place, it lit up like a discotheque, as Hamlin described. Naturally, those that had been following Magnata's case were determined to solve the case and find Luca. 
According to Deanna, the video of Lynn's murder was very Luca-esque and the song used True Faith had been used in montages of himself that he had posted online. The Facebook group emailed the footage to their contact at the Toronto Police Department. They were able to trace recent photos of Luca to a street in Montreal, but it didn't help much. After all, Luca fled the country. It didn't matter that he'd been in Montreal in the first place. Deanna tried searching for the puppy want ads on Craigslist, knowing that Luca must have gotten the puppy in the video footage from somewhere. The author was looking for any dog and claimed their family owned a pet shop, therefore they had experience with animals. She was familiar with his style of writing and Deanna searched through posts to try and find the specific ads Luca may have made. Deanna, John, and other internet sleuths continually warned the police that Luca was dangerous, but they claimed that no one listened to them. Deanna herself admitted that she went off on the police on Twitter demanding answers and action. And while I do understand their frustration, I don't see how the police could have arrested Luca any sooner. As an aside, it does leave a bad taste in my mouth to see the documentary continually mimic reactions from the Facebook group, to see Deanna with the username Body Movin' commenting, oh shit, or fuck, or OMFG on news articles during the time. It just, it rubs me the wrong way, but we'll get on, we'll get to that in just a moment. Now, this was obviously a very devastating time for Jun Lin's family. They flew from China to Montreal to meet with the police and officials from Concordia University while stories about the horrors their son endured spread like wildfire. According to a June 2012 article in The Star, the whole affair has been unbearable for the family, especially Lin's mother. The head of the Concordia Chinese Students Association, Shi Yan, was present and said, Lin's mother was very emotional. She was crying all the time. It was really terrible just being there. We didn't understand a word she was saying. She was crying a lot. She could barely walk. We had to help her. Shi Yan said he was only able to make out a short single phrase. We come to take you home now. Su Zhang, consul at the Consulate General of China in Montreal said, they have a heavy heart. It's very painful for them. Losing a child so young, as they're finally pursuing their dreams would be difficult for anyone, but I can't imagine how Lin's family felt when they heard about what happened in the video. A recent graduate of Concordia, Angela Huang, said she was worried for the city after attending the memorial. She helps Chinese immigrants adapt to the city, so for her and her friends to witness these events was not only jarring, but deeply upsetting. Thankfully, Luca would face justice soon. And although there's never a good time to put a sponsor into an episode, I think right before we talk about him getting caught, this is where we're going to place today's sponsor as a moment to breathe after kind of dealing with everything we just heard. Now, I know we need a break for today's episode because my God, is it a rough one. However, I don't actually have a sponsor for today's episode, so you just get to deal with me for a minute. And today I am just reminding you that I have a Twitch and I'm getting back into live streaming and I'm just very politely saying, please come hang out with me on Twitch. My Twitch account is twitch.tv slash the Illuminati. And I am gonna start streaming there a little more actively one to three times a week. I might play video games over there from time to time, but to be completely honest, most of the time what I'm doing is almost an extension of these episodes where I'm taking a look at what's going on in the news or maybe current events, things that might take me a little longer and more research before they end up in an episode here. And in just a very few short weeks, I'm going to be debuting my very first VTuber model over on the Twitch channel. So if you wanna come hang out, talk about some current events, see what's going on in the world, and you know, obviously interact a little bit, uh, make sure you go to twitch.tv slash the Illuminati. All right, um, let's get back to it. After fleeing to Paris, Luca boarded a train to Berlin. And by this point, the news was heavily reporting about Luca and the murder. Deanne and other internet sleuths found an article that Luca had written years before called How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found and attempted to use it to determine where he might be. While some speculated that Luca wanted notoriety, Luca's mother insisted that detectives should be looking for Manny, the ex-lover who, according to Luca, forced him to feed one of his kittens to a python and drown the other. Luca's mother insisted that Manny had been Luca's keeper, an abusive stalker. Detectives, however, were convinced that if Luca got the chance, he would kill again. But thankfully, he did not get another chance. While Luca was Googling himself, searching for his own mugshot in an internet cafe, he was spotted by an employee. He initially denied his identity to the Berlin police, but eventually he admitted, quote, okay, you got me, end quote. Just a couple weeks later, Luca was brought back to Canada. Detective Hamlin claims that it was a media circus and Luca seemed to enjoy every moment of it. 
he achieved celebrity status. Luca's mother, on the other hand, said she saw confusion and fear in her son's face and that the reporting and transportation was overkill. Throughout the interview and the forensic psychiatry evaluation, as the case against Luca began to grow, he stuck to the story of Manny. Luca told his mother that Manny had wanted to record Luca and Jun Lin sleeping together, but as the night progressed, Manny gave Luca orders to kill Lin. According to Luca, Manny didn't appear in any of the apartment surveillance videos because he was outside the apartment building in a black SUV. Yet, as Deanna and John Green explain, Manny was nothing more than a movie character. Another one of Luca's aliases had been Kay Trammell, a potential reference to Catherine Trammell in the movie Basic Instinct. In the movie, Trammell kills her lover with an ice pick and has an abusive ex-boyfriend named Manny Vasquez. Deanna and John argue that Luca's crime was an homage to his favorite movie. And what makes it especially eerie is that he was literally crafting an alibi and defense well over a year before committing the crime. No phone records showed Luca receiving phone calls that night from Manny or anyone else, proving how incredibly premeditated the crime was. Deanna says that she just worries sometimes if her enthusiasm only fed Luca's narcissism, and that's where the documentary ends. A vain young man obsessed with pop culture recreates a murder scene from basic instinct in one of the most sickening ways imaginable. But that isn't the whole story though, because there's still much more that's left untouched. For example, during his trial, Luca's father testified that his children were mixed up kids and they still are. And he also told the court that despite taking nearly a dozen different medications, he still hears voices to this day. However, in the Netflix documentary and in the newspapers, Luca is continually referred to as a wannabe reality TV show or a celebrity. And they're not entirely wrong. As far back as high school, teachers and classmates remember him for his vanity. And even his mother cites his love of movies within the documentary. But I would also argue that leaving Luca's psychological problems, his father's psychological issues and their hospitalization history out of the documentary is kind of irresponsible. And to be honest, people are split on the issue. There's been speculation that Luca faked his diagnosis to receive money from the Ontario Disability Support Program. Defense lawyer, Luke Leclerc, on the other hand, put several doctors on the stand. Montreal Gazette writes, while in detention, Rene Roy saw Magnata once every two weeks beginning in November, 2012, about four months after Magnata's arrest in Berlin. She described him as sad, detached emotionally, and that he spoke in a monotone voice. He denigrated himself and wondered out loud why he was born. He worried about his grandmother. He often was paranoid and thought the phones in prison were tapped. He had a hard time separating his paranoia from reality, Roy told the court Monday. He thought two other inmates were collecting information about him in his trial. It's possible that this was also just part of Luca's plan. And, you know, seeing as experts themselves disagree about Luca's diagnosis, I obviously can't say with any certainty if Luca has a mental illness or if he does, what it might be. You can see a psychiatric evaluation report if you want in my sources where Joel Watts, the psychiatrist for the defense published his findings, interviews, toxicology reports, like it's all there. So feel free to take a look if you want to dig deeper. Right now, I'll just mention a few highlights. In the past family psychiatry history section, Luca claims that his mother secretly wanted him and his siblings to be abducted as a child because when he was afraid of a strange man lurking around the house, she insisted they stay outdoors. His obsession with old movies is incredibly clear in his past psychiatry history section. Watts writes, when asked to describe his experience with mental illness further, Mr. Magnata explained that Marilyn Monroe's soul was inside him at times because she had a lot of sex. When I dress up as her, sometimes I feel like she is making me more beautiful. I have a connection with her because of her childhood. I love her so much. He would feel that she was doing things that he was doing. He wanted very much to be her. The report seems to lend credence to both sides. The idea that Luca wanted to emulate his Hollywood idols and the idea that mental illnesses contribute to his actions. Again, even with these 124 pages that go into great detail about Luca's life, we don't really know what the truth is. It doesn't really help that the experts in this case have been hired for the defense or the prosecution. So we don't really even have an unbiased independent opinion. Plus Joel Watts as an evaluator has come into question because he was also employed with the police department, which suggested that he agreed with police that Luca was acting. Nothing about what Luca did is defensible regardless of which psychiatrist is saying what and who may be correct and who may not be. But if we forget about his history and whatever he was going through, then we forget that this was preventable. And no, I don't mean that cops should have arrested him based on the speculation of internet sleuths. I believe Luca should have been properly evaluated back in 2004, eight years before the murder took place and six years before he began abusing animals. 
2004 is when police alleged he sexually assaulted a woman and videotaped it. Yet after watching this documentary twice, I don't see it mentioned at all. And interestingly enough, again, the Crown dropped the charge before the case went to trial. Why? Answering this question and properly addressing it would hopefully help us better understand how to stop criminals like Luca before they can hurt innocent people like Jun Lin. Though some articles mention the sexual assault as having taken place in 2005, it's barely mentioned in the first place. And when it is, there's really no light shed on the reasoning behind his incredibly light sentence. As for the murder of Jun Lin, Luca was sentenced to life in prison. With good behavior and the possibility of parole, he could actually walk free as early as 2039. After what he's done and the brutal nature of his crimes, I believe that Luca is a danger to society and should not be able to walk free. Whether in prison or in a treatment facility, I'm not entirely sure, but at the end of the day, my heart breaks for Edward and Jen Lin's families. Although we can't know if Edward would have taken his own life regardless of the harassment from the Facebook group, he still spent his last days being threatened and bullied. Plus, seriously, the fake username he created was Jamzy Cramsalot in his ass. And if that isn't an obvious troll account, then I don't know what is. Even if Deanna and John knew that he wasn't the one responsible, it's the way the group as a whole acted without any evidence that proves we really do need to be careful when we are trying to act like internet sleuths and detectives because you can really stir people up and someone can really get hurt. As for Jun Lin's family, my heart breaks for them because words are simply not enough. It's disheartening to hear how little Jun is actually mentioned in this case and to see articles refer to him as a forgotten victim. Luca's history, motivations, and strange behavior captured people's attention. And there's far more information available about him than there is for Jun. The documentary mentions him so briefly, yet found plenty of time for countless montages of Facebook reactionary posts calling for the kitten killer a sick fuck over and over with variations of the term. I did find it interesting to see the case from the point of view of those who witnessed it unfold and many reviews about it are positive. But then, as I said earlier, the lack of context that might provide some insight as to how we stop these cases in the future is also totally missing here. Some websites have even called the documentary straight up dangerous and claim that it embodies the worst of true crimes, more voyeuristic and complicit elements. Stuart Heritage, writer for The Guardian, says that the story is incredible, violently distressing, and calls out the series as a whole. There are elements of don't fuck with cats that play out like the film Catfish, if Catfish had any real stakes. But it also takes time to explore the darker impulses of the amateur detectives. The fate of one falsely identified suspect is genuinely horrible to witness and key members of the investigation repeatedly ask themselves whether they were solving a crime or simply egging on a violent criminal. One key member, simply named Deanna Thompson, is the de facto narrator of the series. As you'd expect from someone as very online as her, she's incisive and witty and quick to pull the threads together in a dynamic way. But that's arguably the biggest problem with the series. This is a show with a jokey title and a self-aware narrator that splashes around in some of the worst human behavior imaginable. It still makes me deeply uneasy that a man who committed an awful crime purely to gain notoriety has now been dragged out of obscurity to be celebrated in a buzzy Netflix show. The best thing about Don't Fuck With Cats is that the makers seem to at least acknowledge this. The worst thing is that they went ahead and made it anyway. If these Facebook groups hadn't given Luca the attention he wanted, would he have continued? Was this in part because of an unchecked mental illness, a cry for attention, or something else? Was any of the information they gathered actually useful to police? Some argue that it's really hard to tell. I have some incredibly mixed and uneasy feelings about the whole thing, which is why I wanted to look into the case on my own terms to see if I could better understand a bit about what happened here. And to be totally honest, I'm still left feeling really disturbed and not sure if I'll really ever be able to sort out my thoughts on this and get a logical answer. It's probably not the most exciting, decisive or fun answer I could deliver, but sometimes the answer is just that is, it leaves me with more questions than answers and gives me more time to think about what it is that I've actually researched and presented today, because sometimes I just don't know the answer here. Life isn't always black and white. There's many, many shades of gray. And this is one of those many shades of gray. So thank you for spending some time listening to today's episode. I know it was very dark, very unsettling, and probably not the easiest listen in the entire world, but I thank you all the same for being here. 
Let me know your thoughts. I'm sure you have many and diverse thoughts about this entire situation, the documentary, the handling of everything, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me today and I'll see you in the next episode.